And now, as we are able, let us stand and share our call to worship. We gather in this place while we gather around the world. We speak in many tongues. We proclaim the same faith. We come in many colors, ages, sizes, and shapes. We have different cultures and lifestyles. In common, we have your love. In common, we have your peace. In common, we have your hope. Lord of all, we have come together in worship. Lift our eyes to your mercy. Lift our voices to your praise. Lift our hearts to your peace-filled promise. In the name of Jesus, amen. Responsibly, we share our prayer of confession. Forgiving God, we confess that we are a fearful people. Too often, we walk through the abundance of your world, afraid there is not enough. We covet what little our neighbors have. We hoard the goodness of your creation. We make of ourselves earthly titles and names as though human honor was itself a finite commodity. We make idols of scarcity and want, as though they and not you were eternal. Have mercy on us, gently ease our grip, and open our hands and our eyes that we, trusting in your righteousness, may truly live out the heart of all commandments to love you with our whole being, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. And we open our hearts in a few moments of silent prayer. Friends, the Gospels inspire us from Jesus' earthly ministry to imitate his life. We thank you, God, for the living word, the spiritual presence of the risen Christ, and the community of faith that he creates.
in symbols of worship, and in the ministry of faith, unite us in our search for deeper communion in Christ. Please be seated. Today's scripture reading is 2 Timothy chapters 1, verses 1 through 14. First, some context. As we hear this letter of Paul to an early believer in Christ, we realize that even the earliest church was a world church, transcending the boundaries of nations, races, social class, and economic level. This is the beginning of Paul's second letter to T Timothy. It is a letter of encouragement and guidance. Timothy was a grown child of a Greek father and a Jewish Christian mother, and he had become Christian before meeting Paul. But Paul chose him as his helper and younger colleague and taught Timothy how to stand tall, strong against the pressures and threats he would encounter because of his faith. Now, 2 Timothy 1 through 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did. When I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is, in within, that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join, me, join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, and for this reason I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day which I am, what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. This is the witness of the Apostle Paul. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Hello, I'm Caden. One of my favorite activities from the SALT trip was going to the Barneville Community Cafe. Our mission trip themed verse was Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine. I enjoyed getting to know the owners of the cafe, Cliff and Yvonne, and learning what they do to let their light shine during the pandemic. They saw their friends and neighbors struggling, so they decided to turn their cafe into zero pay or what you can pay. People who visit aren't expected to pay anything at all, but some people give a little more to help the cafe. 
The cafe is like going into someone's home. It's very welcoming. There are many choices on the menu, and you can even see them prepare the food. We each ordered what we wanted and enjoyed eating together while Yvonne shared stories of her life and while they stayed and why they, why they started the Zero Pay Cafe. I think it's amazing that they provide free meals for people at the cafe. The whole community really seems to come together and support them. Thank you. Uh, uh, um, I really had a fun time at the Soul Trip. I like that we got to do lots of fun things as a group. Some of my favorite things were talk and nature, the nature walk, playing with all the kids t together, going to the cafe, eating food with everyone, and campfire time. Good morning, all. Um, so, the cell trip let us do a lot of things. Uh, part of it was just the nature of us. We were camping, so we were with our family, and we're in nature. Um, and nature is kind of what my touch point was. I grew up in North Central Wisconsin, so I was surrounded by wilderness all the time. My career called me to more urban environments. I'm, so I'm in technology. So every now and then, to be able to be out there and not be quite so passive with nature, but to touch it has been it's been rewarding. Um, so in June, we did a lot of maintenance in the prairie, um, cut out invasive species, destroyed some brush, you know, so the prairie could grow. Um, at the time, we were told there's a rare plant out there, so uh, uh, purple milkweed, and we found a few of those. So they're an endangered species in Wisconsin. So it was kind of thrilling to just be able to see something that is rare. Um, and then you hear things like, you know, when I was a kid in the 80s, monarch butterflies, you could just walk with the door, and there they were. You take them for granted. And now they're like 1% of their total population from then. So 99% of them gone, um, which is a pretty big blow. But there are things we can do, like working on this prairie to help out. Um, yesterday, a group of us were there, and we collected pounds worth of um, grass seeds. And they're going to dry them and then use them again this spring to help reseed the prairie. Um, I was told that that was probably worth over $1,000 worth that we help collect. So um, hopefully, you know, everyone can touch a small part of nature and help bring it back. There are prairies much closer than Blue Mounds. I mean, just past the Reddington soccer fields, there are acres of prairie that Madison's trying to restore. So that's another area to look, to lend a helping hand there too. So join us if you can. Great, and thank you again so much for your witness over the last three weeks. This has been wonderful to be able to share that with you. Our gospel lesson from Luke continues the series as we've walked through the gospel of Luke, and we remember that Jesus has been telling many parables of the kingdom of God, of the realm of God and the world, and he's also been teaching by word and example to his to his disciples what the cost of discipleship can be. Now in chapter 17, we hear Jesus uh, receive a request from his disciples and probably an exasperated Jesus responds. 
So the disciples said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord replied, If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing and tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink? Later, you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, Say, <clears throat> we are worthless slaves. We have only done what we ought to have done. May God bless to us this reading from the gospel. This is the word of our Lord.
After that reading from the Gospel, it may sound a bit unpious for me to say, but I think Jesus was getting rather fed up with his disciples by this point in the Gospel of Luke. I mean, he has been teaching them by word and deed <clears throat> over and over again what the life of discipleship will mean, what dedication it calls for, and what resources are at their disposal through their faith. And yet they continue to come up with gems like, increase our faith. And so Jesus says to them, if, if, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, and he does mean if, and a mustard seed is very, very tiny indeed. I suppose it's like most things that until we are tested in some real way, until the crisis is right upon us, until we're at the brink, we really aren't completely sure what we're truly capable of doing, or rather, of what God is capable of doing through us. And so, while we don't want to have crises or confrontations or looming challenges, these are often the things that do increase our faith. And I think Jesus realized that it was going to take the crisis of his own crucifixion before his disciples, before his disciples could really show through their fearful abandonment what they didn't understand and then come to truly understand what faith really means for them. Well, we live in a world that is increasingly and constantly on the brink of one catastrophe after another. We have to acknowledge that. And yet with little apparent learning from past human errors. And so as we gather on World Communion Sunday with Christians around the world, we really do need to ask ourselves collectively a very hard question. And that is, what difference does our Christian faith really make to the way that we live and the choices that we make. And on a more personal note, we have to ask ourselves, what difference does my Christian faith really make to the way I live and the choices that I make? One of the churches that I've served over the years, we had heard that there was a new type of small group study and fellowship that might prove of interest, we thought, to a few of our members, and so we offered it as an adult education option. And this was to have breakfast <clears throat> together and to discuss a case study in Christian business ethics, one that we had told everyone to read before, a relatively short chapter, just read that case study. And we expected that there, we might have a few members who were going to show up at 6 a.m. on a weekday for breakfast and study. And we had 60. We had 60 regular, eager, hungry members and their friends from the community who came every single week. There was truly some kind of hunger other than, <clears throat> other than breakfast that was going on among these people. Now, among the people that came, there was one man who was a church member of my church who ran a factory. And after several of these studies, he found himself to be in just such a case study with his factory. For you see, the, a young factory worker who was recently married, who had a small child, was discovered to have stolen tools from the factory, some of them quite valuable. And this was over time. So this church member, this factory boss, knew what he had to do. Fire him immediately, as an example to all the others. But he wrestled with what his faith was saying to him, all that annoying stuff about forgiveness, repentance, restoration, turning the other cheek. And, and he said to me, and I quote, wow, Jesus really causes trouble. If I don't fire this guy, 
The other workers are going to think that I'm weak as a boss, and without that respect, I won't have control. And so he said to me, Tom, what does Jesus want me to do? Right. <laughs> and I said, you know, sometimes I think Jesus wants us to learn from what the wisdom of our own faith tells us to do. That's called a cop-out, by the way. <laughs> so, he did pray about it. He thought about it. And he called in this young worker who knew by now that he had been discovered. He came in guilty and dejected. And his boss said to him, I am supposed to fire you right away. And maybe I should. But I'm not going to. I have prayed about this, and my faith tells me that you need to be given another chance. And so I'm going to dock your pay for the next two weeks, and you're going to return all the tools you have, and you're going to pay for all the ones that you don't have any longer. The young worker left, and he went out onto the factory floor, and he told the others at the factory what the boss had decided, and they were stunned. The conclusion of this story is that this young man became the hardest working person in that factory. And what's more, productivity in the entire factory rose over 15%. Imagine having a boss with faith and a heart. Now friends, <clears throat> compassion and good ethics are not exclusive to Christianity. Surely, if you were not a professing UCC-style Christian, wouldn't you still try to be an upright, contributing citizen? Wouldn't you care about the environment? Wouldn't you obey the law? Wouldn't you seek to be ethical in business and community? Wouldn't you contribute to food collections? Wouldn't you do any number of good things which any citizen in a fairly affluent and culturally advantaged community like ours is likely to do, you probably would. But when we have that mustard seed of faith and the huge crisis comes, it's then that we find that the seed has indeed grown into the biggest of plants against all odds and often against the ways of the world and we can find that faith is equal to the challenge. In his letter, in his epistle, Paul writes to Timothy, whose father was a Greek and whose mother was Jewish. And Timothy had become a Christian before he met Paul, as we heard in the reading. But Paul realizes that Timothy has chosen a faith which neither the secular Greeks nor the Jews are going to accept or affirm. It's going to be tough. And Paul encourages Timothy. He tells him to rely on the purpose and grace of God, not on the strength of his own works. Paul knows that the externals of society are going to tell Timothy that he is all wrong, such that only his internal faith is going to hold him together and hold him up. And so Paul encourages Timothy to follow the pattern of the sound words, he writes, which means to listen to his own heart while remembering the teachings of Paul about Jesus. Paul encourages Timothy to guard the truth entrusted to him by the Holy Spirit which dwells within him. You just heard me use the word encourage several times. Encouragement, the sermon title. It sounds like such a nice, broad, wholesome, who can argue with that term, encouragement. But encouragement comes from the same root as the word courage, from the French cour, the heart. And the heart of our Christian faith is different from social conventions. 
no matter how good and wholesome they are. Our Christian faith calls upon us to listen for the purposes of God, which may hold for us riskiness that we might not choose to accept. It means that we have to have the courage to take to heart internally the radicality of all these professions and creeds and prayers and scriptures that we repeat week after week. It means to be surprised when we finally realize that religion is the minimum structure that the group of people need, but that faith is an infinite calling of God upon our sometimes unwilling hearts. Dr. William Willimon, who was once the chaplain at Duke University and a professor of Christian ministry at Duke Divinity School, now is a Methodist bishop. And in his writings, he recalled an experience when he was serving as a pastor. You see, there was a young woman named Anne who after college had enrolled in pharmacy school and from time to time she came home and visited and worshiped with her mother and father and one Sunday evening after her visits Dr. Williman received a telephone call from Anne's father. Do you know what happened? Anne just called to say that she's decided to drop out of pharmacy school. Really? Dr. Williman exclaimed. What on earth is leading her to do a thing like that? Well, we're not sure, preacher. You know how much Anne likes you. We thought maybe you could call her up and talk some sense into her. Well, Dr. Willeman told the distraught father he'd be glad to do whatever he could. And so he called Anne. He reminded her of all her hard work and her achievements. He urged her to think carefully before throwing this away. And he said to her, how in the world did you come to this decision? And she said, well, it was your sermon yesterday <laughs> that started me thinking. You said that God has something important for each one of us <clears throat> to, <clears throat> to do in our own way. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not here in pharmacy school because I want to serve God. I'm here to get a job and to make money and to look out for myself. I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to get into the same meaningless rat race as everyone else. But then I remembered that good summer I spent working with the church literacy program among migrant workers' kids. I really think I was serving God then. I decided after your sermon to go back there and give my life to helping those kids have a chance at life. There's a difference between religious practice alone and religion combined with faith, especially in a society that pays a lot of homage to religious practice. And the difference is God. God calling us from the heart, encouraging us, that makes for faith. We need, as the great preacher Henry Emerson Fosdick once said, we need to say yes to what God has chosen to do within us. That calling of God to the heart, that's the mustard seed that knows no limits, that grows exponentially once we put it into the soil. It is that calling to the heart that's placed before us whenever we share these symbols of communion. God is not giving us a religious ritual to perform here. God is speaking your name with a promise to love and a calling to ministry. I've often spoken of the wonderful writer Frederick Beekner. He's also a minister. He once shared a personal experience of receiving communion when he was at an Episcopal church. The priest was someone whom he knew, and as he was kneeling, as was the custom there, and waiting for the bread and the cup, he, he heard his friend priest 
moving along the railing from person to person. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And Fred writes, when he got to me, he put in another word. The word was my name. He said, the body of Christ, Freddie, the bread of heaven. There was nothing extraordinary about this priest knowing my name since he was a friend. I knew he knew it. And there was nothing extraordinary about him using it in the service, but the effect on me was extraordinary. It caught me totally off guard. It moved me deeply. For the first time, perhaps in my life, it struck me that Jesus picked up the bread at his last meal and said, this is my body which is broken for you. He was doing it not just in some ritual way for humankind in general, but in an unthinkably personal way for every particular man, woman, and child who has ever existed or ever would exist most unthinkable of all, as far as I was concerned, maybe he was breaking the bread for me. As we take this communion today, as we think about the meaning of it, not as a ritual, but rather as an act of faith, we need to realize that there are many young adults in our community, in our region, and throughout our society Many young adults who have never maybe been given the opportunity to even say yes to God in their hearts. And we're provide, we are called to provide that opportunity for them. And there are many middle-aged and older adults who just simply have not found truth in the institutional church. And they're turned off or they're discouraged. But we have to realize the church is not truth. It never has been. And yet it knows the truth that God places in our hearts. And it's still there to be discovered if we hear God calling our name. We owe it to the adults of our society to share that truth. The bottom line that like with Timothy and Paul's other churches, the Christian faith grew and strengthened the most during the times of its worst challenge, its harshest persecution, its least social acceptance. And it's because people sought God in their hearts. And this communion today represents a great challenge to us as a church, as a congregation, and to us as individual believers. We are called to something radical. Not to make the church ex acceptable, but to offer the encouragement of God to all people. That is our communion today with the world. Amen.
Friends, on this day around the world, the table has been set. And at this moment, we are one family at one table. Imagine the world seated with Christ at a sumptuous feast. Today we have a glimpse of that with World Communion Sunday. We have the banners that symbolize the many languages, the many countries, the many peoples who share together. Our communion meal shared by us having the bread that Christ breaks and the wine, which is the fruit of the vine. This is an open communion because any person who professes faith in Jesus Christ or his seeking faith in Jesus Christ is welcome and embraced at Christ's table today, regardless of any religious affiliations or state of being. Just belief, just a seeking for faith in Jesus as Lord. And that's what makes us one people of faith throughout the world. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Embracing God, we give thanks for being brought together by your spirit. In your presence, we come to know the true depths of your love for us. And this is good. In your presence, our eyes are opened and we see best the creation that you have entrusted to us. And it is good. In your presence, the fullness of grace teaches us to love one another as you love us. And that is good. So we come together at this table to remember the sacred act of Jesus, then and now, for it is good. Holy God, you are the God of all peoples and nations. And on this Sunday, when we gather in our faith and our prayer from every nation and every time zone, every climate and terrain on earth, every language, every yearning of humankind for peace of heart and peace of world, we surround your table of grace in hope. We hope that you will lift our vision beyond the busy tasks and the duties that limit our downward gaze. Let us see your love and presence in the faces of a diverse humankind that you have made. Let us find joy in seeing life's moments through the perspectives of many so that our knowledge gains understanding. And let us open our arms wide to become a community that welcomes and embraces so that we model the vision of your realm and the world that Jesus taught and toward which he leads us as he journeys with us. On this day and in these times, we lift before you all of our concerns, all of our joys. Some of them we have spoken aloud, some we share in community, some are brought in silent sharing of spirit, some even in words that cannot begin to express, and yet which you know. We do ask that you envelop in our love and our prayers Kathy home as she continues to gain strength. We pray for Doris Waldman, for the inspiration and the spirit that she shows and that she might continue to recover and to recover well, to be strong. We pray for all the people of coastal Florida, for the ravages of Hurricane Ian, as well as all people worldwide who suffer the effects of nature that are amplified by global warming. We pray for those who experience increasing daily suffering and the madness of conquest, especially those that are suffered by the people of Ukraine, the senseless waste, the inhumanity. We pray for them. We pray that we can join them in the solidarity of love. 
No, God, we pray with rejoicing that we can share as a witness to our community with our friends of the Methodist Church, that we can welcome them as neighbors, and that together we can welcome all the new neighbors. So joyful embracing God, God of this whole earth, of all peoples, in all the ways that we express faith and live faith and understand faith, we're brought together at this table and we're brought together as we share the prayer that Jesus taught us as his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we remember that Jesus, who blessed peacemakers on the night that he was arrested, took bread. And after he gave thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples as he gives it to his disciples now, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this remembering me. In the same fashion, he took a cup after supper, and he said to his disciples, as he says now, this cup is the new covenant that is sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink this, do this remembering me. For every time that we eat this bread, that we drink this cup, we proclaim the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. share together our prayer after communion responsively. Almighty God, all thoughts of truth and peace come from you. Kindle in the hearts of all your children the love of peace. And guide with your wisdom the leaders of the nations so that your kingdom will go forth in peace and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As an act of worship, let us make our offerings that do God's work in the world.
and dedication, let us be united in prayer. Holy God, whose love we seek to reflect in our lives, hear our prayers. Let the offerings we bring today be a source of healing, teaching, love, and especially peace in today's turbulent world. Hear our petitions, spoken and unspoken, and gather them together with those of your people around the world, so that in our collective life and our hope together, we can be guided and oriented to your vision of shalom. Grant us courage where there is fear and hope where there is despair, that we might dare to live out our calling as loving peacemakers and merciful justice seekers. In the name of the one who called your children blessed peacemakers, amen. Friends, we have eaten the bread of new creation. We bear witness to God's abundant goodness. We've heard the word proclaimed. We bear witness to the gifts of joy and peace given in Christ's resurrection. And so friends, let us go into the world to be servants of God's justice. Let us go into the world to be makers of Christ's peace. Let us be those who show the presence of God, the first and the last, is with us all throughout all God's world. Amen. <laughs> 